Welcome to A Look Ahead. We're delighted that you've decided to join us. You probably know by now that we study the Sabbath School lessons as prepared by the Seventh-day Adventist Church. And this is a new series, a series that will be studied during the months of April, May, and June of 2016. This is lesson one in that series for April 2 of 2016, entitled The Son of David. This series, of, as we mentioned, is on the book of Matthew. We'll talk about Matthew. We'll talk about the book of Matthew. We'll talk about all it says about Jesus Christ. It's a very interesting series, at least the part which I've had a chance to study so far. I think you'll find it very fascinating, too. I hope your Bible, you have your Bible handy. A lot of it's going to be easy to find because it's in the first part of Matthew, but nevertheless, we want to begin with a word of prayer. Our wonderful Father, what a privilege it is to gather with friends and to talk about you and your time here on this earth and the messages that you left for us. We thank you for the work done by your friend Matthew. Help us to understand it as a result of this study better than we have before is our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. Matthew starts the book of his book. We call it Matthew, the book of Matthew. With what? What's right up front? Ge genealogy. Genealogy of Jesus. Um, what are we? Who is Matthew writing to here? Everybody? Anybody? Well, we're, we're going to talk a little bit about that in a moment. Uh, Matthew, is, his, his gospel is written primarily for Jewish Christians. So that's one of the questions. So Christians who have a Jewish have, background. Have a Jewish background, which would be logically most of the Christians of the day because he was mm -hmm. working with Jews. So before he became a disciple, what did Matthew do? IRS agent. An IRS agent. Oh, brother. You mean the United States was way back then? Well, the equivalent. The equivalent, okay. He was that's called right. a tax collector or a publican. Uh, that's not a Republican, that's a publican. Um, and what did the Jewish people think about the publicans? <laughs> Thought they were traitors. Yeah. I mean, these are people who are basically robbed their own flesh and blood of their own relatives to, to pay the Roman government. They paid the, they they gave paid taxes to Caesar. They paid taxes to Herod Antipas, and of course they were not loved for that for sure. And, and with the permission of Rome, a lot of them collected a lot more than they were required to collect, and they pocketed it. So they still do that today. So it's nothing new. <laughs> what? Yeah. You think somebody might do that. Mm -hmm. Later in his life, Matthew gave humanity something of great value, not a tax receipt but a precious account of the life of Jesus. So he started doing something a whole lot better, right? Where did he get that information? Well, let's talk about that. Who was Matthew? We've said he was a tax collector. Well, this, we know he was about also a disciple. Okay, where did he come from? Do you remember? What was he doing when he was called? He hmm. was the tax collector in Capernaum the city of several of the disciples. So this is the guy that was extracting taxes from them. And Jesus came walking along one day and Matthew was in his tax collector's booth there beside the road. And Jesus said, follow me. And what did Matthew do? He climbed out of that tax booth and never went back. Well, one of the questions about the book of Matthew, was it written in Greek or was it written in Hebrew? Or maybe Aramaic? Some people think it was written in Hebrew. And some people think it was written in Aramaic. Yeah, so what do you do? And then later translated into Greek. The only, the only version of Matthew that we have is the Greek. But it has a lot of Hebrew or Aramaic kind of ideas in it. And so maybe Matthew was just thinking in Hebrew and Aramaic, but writing in Greek. And of course, do you think he spoke Greek? Mm -hmm. As a tax collector, he almost certainly had to speak Greek. Probably had to speak everything. Yeah. Greek, Latin, Arabic. Arabic. Well, he was the son of Alphaeus. We don't know who Alphaeus was. He was not, I'm sure, the Alphaeus who was the father of James, the, one of the other disciples. 
He was called by Jesus to be a disciple after working for some time as a tax collector, Matthew 9. Let's just read that, Matthew 9, 9 and 10. Jesus left that place, and as he was walking along, he saw a tax collector named Matthew sitting in his office. He said to him, follow me. Matthew got up and followed him. Now, why would somebody do that? Was this an order or was this a suggestion? You know, we, we read it as, follow me. Maybe he said, follow me. Yeah, it's an invitation. It's an invitation. Have you ever, I mean, Matthew must have been married. He must have had a family. What, what, what did he go home and tell his wife that night? Quit my job. Mm -hmm. <laughs> well, serious. I mean, yeah. Serious. Yeah. Like on sabbatical. She says, man, how are we going to live? Mm -hmm. And he says, I, I'm following someone who can take care of that. He probably said he got a stash. <laughs> <laughs> maybe, didn't t maybe back then they didn't tell their wives anything. They just did it and their wives had to cooperate. The good old days. <laughs> good days? Sounds like you're rather fond. <laughs> you think Matthew was rich or poor? Rich. Why? Well, because he was a tax collector and got uh, commissions on that, okay. basically, or extra taxes, and he demonstrated it by throwing a feast for Jesus. He threw a big feast for Jesus after he started following Jesus, didn't he? So that didn't come cheap. Had plenty of money stashed away. And what else happened after me, after Matthew started following Jesus? Why did he throw this big feast? You answered that question for me. Why did he throw this big feast? Do you think well, he was happy to be a follower of Jesus? Well, possibly, but I, Do you throw I'm in, inclined to believe it might be uh, uh, a thing to um, a party where people come and meet meet this new guy and get acquainted with him and uh, kind of like a political thing. They'll have a fundraiser for, uh, for a politician to come and people can meet them and so on and so forth and make connections. And so maybe that was part of the reason for the feast. Matthew was wanting to introduce this guy to a whole lot more people. Do you call your friends in and say, let's <coughs> celebrate because I know Jesus Christ? Did no, not that? as often as I should. Actually, I'm not sure I can remember the last time I did that. <laughs> well, after Matthew became a follower of Jesus, a whole lot of other outcasts, who would that include? Besides well, other, publicans? Other tax collectors. Uh, yeah, the women. Women, especially women of mm -hmm. ill repute. Gentiles, Samaritans. What would we do if um, one of our pastors today started collecting a whole lot of people like that around him? Might kick him out. <laughs> kick him out? You know, it could be argued, uh, and it, uh, it could be easily argued that when I go to church, he's collected a lot of people like that. I when I walk into church, it's filled with people like that. The outcasts, the publicans, the tax collectors? Well, I can think of some people that are kind of like that. <laughs> <laughs> well, we don't, we don't know very much of Matthew's story about Matthew after the crucifixion. Early in the second century, Papias, and he's re we don't have Papias' writings himself, but Eusebius reported on what Papias said in his Historia Ecclesiastica, Volume 3, parag uh, Paragraph 39, he said Matthew was a collector of the oracles of Jesus. Shortly thereafter, the gospel as a whole was attributed to Matthew. And I didn't put all the names in. There's a whole lot of people in 2nd and 3rd century who said, yes, Matthew was written by Matthew. Later reports suggest that Matthew may have traveled to Ethiopia, Persia, Parthia, Macedonia, and Syria. Those places are a long ways apart. I thought, correct me, I thought... Mark is the one that's given credit for, am I, am I incorrect here? I thought he was the one that wrote the first. No, first he, chronologically, yes. Yes, chronologically he was. What do you, I don't understand chronologically. Well, if you're talking in time. Mark was the first one to write a, a gospel account. Right, exactly. So then how is it we're ascribing Matthew as one who is, is 
We're just talking about Matthew's Gospel now. We're not talking about him relative to Mark. Well, maybe I didn't understand your question. Well, maybe I didn't understand your 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 comments there you about the pa the papist was the saying whole was attributed to Matthew. Right. Yeah. Oh, his whole gospel. Oh, okay. Not not all four of the gospels. Okay. All right. No, his gospel was attributed to him. People said, you know, now a few people <clears throat> said they didn't think so, but most of the mm -hmm. really early outstanding apologists said yes, 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 yes. Right. So so what you're saying is that what we're reading in Matthew, he collected it. Yeah. He put it together, yeah. and it's not he's, he's gathered this stuff from Mark or, or yeah. I see. Okay, all right. Now, I will have to tell you that if you look at the Synoptic Gospels, 90% of what's in Mark is either in Matthew or Luke. Or so, both. Or both, yeah. So a lot of what's in Math, uh, Mark was probably copied by these guys, uh, by, by Matthew and or Luke. But anyway, that's another plagiarism. issue. Hmm? Plagiarism? Well, there wasn't such a thing as plagiarism back in those days. <laughs> Clement of Alexandria, one of those early writers, provided the interesting note that, open quote, the Apostle Matthew partook of seeds and nuts and vegetables without flesh, in his book, Pythagogos, Volume 2, Paragraph 1. It is possible that Matthew suffered a martyr's death, but we cannot be sure. There are those who say that all of the disciples, except John, died martyr's death. We just can't prove that. Well, now getting back to Jesus. One of the great conundrums of the person of Jesus Christ is that he was, according to Christian theology, fully God and fully human at the same time. How is that possible? You can explain that in a few words, right? How many great Christian councils in the first four or five hundred years were held to try to solve that problem? Well, just because it's hard for us to understand how such a thing could be, which makes some sense. I mean, we are mere humans, after all, and to understand, to understand what God is is hard enough, but when understand how it's been combined with God combined himself with something he already made mm -hmm. you know those are um, hard to take in those are those are those are hard things to under to understand well and, and there's great <coughs> passages in the scripture about that John 1 1 to 3 Hebrews 1 1 to 3 we could have put in Colossians 1 Micah 5 2 talks about the history Mark 12, 35 to 37. Ellen White put it in these words, From the days of eternity, the Lord Jesus Christ was one with the Father. He was the image of God, the image of His greatness and majesty, the outshining of His glory. By coming to dwell with us, Jesus was to reveal God both to men and to angels. He was the Word of God, God's thought made audible. Desire of Ages, pages 19, paragraph 1 and 2. I, I just have to tell you a great story. I don't know, some of you out there might have heard this story. The story is told that there was an older African-American pastor in the South who was telling the story about the time when Jesus, at age 12, went to the temple. And you remember that, I mean, that he was there with his parents and then they left him behind and he's sitting there. And so Jesus is starting to ask them questions and they realize this kid has really got the questions. And pretty soon they started asking him questions. And this old pastor, older African-American pastor, reports it like this. says, one of these ancient, this is, of course, speculation, but you can imagine how this would happen. One of these scholars, one of these either Pharisees or Sadducees, turned to Jesus and said, son, how old are you? And Jesus could have said, well, on my mother's side, I'm 12. But on my father's side, I'm older than time. <laughs> I, I just love that response. But it, it, it sort of encapsulates this, this issue. How do, you, how do you put all that together? Well, the divinity of Christ is what's emphasized in the book of John, which is not what we're studying now. It was not Matthew's main concern. Matthew was writing primarily to Jews. 
So he gave the human ancestry of Jesus starting from Abraham through King David through the Babylonian captivity down to Jesus Christ. We must remember that while to a Jew a person's lineage is very important, in God's eyes, how does God look at all that? And I quote Galatians 3.29, If you belong to Christ, then you are the descendants of Abraham and will receive what God has promised. Could that include us? Could we be the descendants of Abraham? Mm. Well, Matthew wanted to make it very clear that Jesus descended from the royal line of David. That is not all. That royal line would continue to reign forever. <coughs> and there's lots of passages. 2 Samuel 7, 16 and 17, Isaiah 9, 6 and 7, Isaiah 11, 1 and 2, Acts 2, 29 and 30. I mean, there's lots of passages about that. So why is a Matthew... Uh feel that this is an important thing to do, to connect him back to David and, and beyond what, what is... Uh, okay. If you were a Jew in Matthew's or in Jesus' day, would it be important for, t for you to know that the Messiah was a descendant of David? Well, on the basis that it was predicted that the Messiah would come through the line of David, so... Uh, <clears throat> that if if that is if that's Matthew's uh, impetus here, that's part of it. He's 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 leading up to the point that you know we're not dealing with just some person here. This was the Messiah, mm -hmm. and this 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 is uh, uh, part of the validation that he certainly uh, could qualify for that. Now, there's something that you may not have tried to do, and I would like to encourage you to do this when you've got a few minutes. Compare Matthew 1 with Luke 3. Now, in Luke, what kind of person was Luke? What was his profession? He was a physician. He was a physician. So he was a little more concerned about the sequence of things and how this all happened. And so he traces the ancestry backwards from Jesus, Joseph, da-da-da-da-da, going back, back, back. And finally, he ends up with the son of Adam, the son of God. Remember. But there's a problem. What's the problem? They list different people. If you look at the ancestry recorded in Matthew and you compare it with Luke, there's almost no overlap. So who's wrong? Well, one goes back through the mother and one goes back through... Okay, how does that work? But, well, it's, it's, it's kind of difficult to go back through Joseph because he wasn't really... <laughs> he wasn't really the father of Jesus. Mm -hmm. So what are we, how we can explain this? I just scratched that part about Joseph. Don't, don't count that genealogy. Well, if you want to look at this question in some more detail, go to our website, www.theox, that's T-H-E-O-X dot O-R-G. Go to Teacher's Guides then Gospels, then Genealogy of Jesus. And you'll see this thing spelled out. There are several possible explanations. The most likely was probably this, that Matthew is tracing the ancestor of Jesus through Joseph because he was recognized as the human father of Jesus, even though he wasn't. That's the way he was, as far as the records are concerned, that's the way he was recorded. Luke, being a Greek physician, not so concerned about the Jewish linea uh, genealogy of the Jewish lineage, said, well, but hold on just a minute. The only human that was a, an ancestor of Jesus was his mother, Mary, right? So we ought to trace this line back to her. But then, if that's the case, why? Well, it, it was a custom in those days, if a couple had only daughters, or only one daughter especially, then when that daughter married, they would adopt her husband as their legal son. So some people say, well, that's how Joseph gets to be traced as the legal father of Jesus, back to his lineage. And the other, so Matthew traces it to Joseph, Jesus traces it to Mary. That's a possibility. We don't know that for sure, but that's a possibility. Well, we probably don't need to say here, but I will. If we had time to study the life stories of all those in the genealogy of Jesus, it would be a sad and discouraging experience. 
entertaining, maybe, but many of those who were even kings turned against God and worshipped Baal and Ashtoreth, and the story goes on and on. But there are some really surprising individuals mentioned in Jesus' genealogy, and who are they? Well, there's the a rather uh, infamous one that we refer to from time to time as Rahab. Okay. Well, an infamous four women. There are four. Are women normally mentioned in genealogies, <coughs> Jewish genealogies? Not at all. <coughs> it's interesting, however, that in modern times, and basically since New Testament times, the Jews have started saying, Trace through the mother. You got to trace someone's lineage through the mother. Why is that? You know who the mother was. You can be pretty sure who the mother is, but you can't always be sure who the father was, right? So, so four women, Tamar, Rahab, Ruth, and Bathsheba. What do we know? Let's look at these women just briefly. What do we know about Tamar? Her story is in Genesis 38. The Canaanite girl who was married she to... She was a Gentile Canaanite. Yeah. Married to a son of Judah. Mm -hmm. He died. Mm -hmm. Married the other son Judah, of Judah. Which Judah is this, just to make sure we're all together? Judah, the son of uh, the Joseph. Son of, of, of no, Jacob. 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 I'm sorry. Of Israel. Jacob, or otherwise known as Israel. His, one of the twelve of tribes. His son, he married a Canaanite woman. And his son, in turn, married Tamar, another Canaanite woman. Okay? So his son, is, his son was half Canaanite already. And now he marries a Canaanite woman. Okay, and what happens in that story? Remember? The, the one son died. He married one the son, son died. So according to Jewish custom, what's supposed to happen next? He married the next younger son. He married, married the next younger son? Of Judah. Uh-huh. And that guy died too. That guy died too for various reasons. And there was another son, but he was, quote, too young. Yes. And so Judah said, go back to your family. Wait until my youngest son grows up, maybe hoping that she would decide to marry someone else or get lost or something. Mm -hmm. He was worried about her because she's wiped out two of his sons already. <laughs> <laughs> well, and then what happened? <clears throat> the colorful part of the story? You don't want me to tell that, do you? <laughs> keep, keep going, Gordon. This You're is, doing well. This is X-rated. Yeah, it is. <clears throat> One time Judah was on his way to shearing sheep and he travels to a village, and there's a woman sitting out there dressed like a prostitute. And he said, well, his, dad, his wife was dead by that time. And he said, well, you know, let me spend a little time with you. And what happened? Well, actually, it's his daughter-in-law. He, he didn't know that. More than, one t more than one time over. Yeah. She got pregnant, and uh, she had some evidence that he... He was with her. Proved that he was the father. Yeah. Yep. And you wonder about things in these stories. You wonder about God's behavior in this story. This woman has been married to two young men who should have been as virile as could be. She did not get pregnant by either one of them. She has one encounter with Judah. Bang, she's pregnant with twins. How did that happen? I'll let, I won't, I'll let you speculate. Is that speculate. entrapment? <laughs> <laughs> okay. well, then I the mean, it, when, you, when you read about Abraham mm -hmm. and God can create an environment there, very special environment where there's fertility and offspring, and then you see this very unusual circumstance, you wonder if he's not tinkering around here too. You think my, God might be exercising birth control of some kind? <coughs> well, <laughs> birth control, we usually think of fertility and lack thereof. <laughs> yeah. <coughs> okay. Well, next we come to Rahab. Who was Rahab? She was the uh, prostitute in Jericho who hid the two spies and said, um, and lied kept them safe, them. lied about them, and kept them safe, and said, please. Save us when you come, and my, me and my family when you come to conquer. And they did, Jericho. and then what happened to her? She married one of the princes of the tribe of Judah. 
and ended up being an ancestor of Jesus. And who was her son? Boaz. Boaz. And who did he marry? Married Ruth. Ruth. How much, how much, Jewish, how much Jewish blood is left in this line? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and, and Ruth was a, Ruth was a Moabitess. Yeah. Okay. <clears throat> so? Well, they're not supposed to hang around with Moabites. No. Let alone marry them for Pete's sake. Exactly. So, and you know about the story of Ruth, et cetera, and how that all happened and so forth. So, and, and why are these people important in our story? Well, they're all the Ruth. ancestors of... Ruth of the, becomes the great-grandmother mm -hmm. of King, of King David. David. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Whoa. Whoa. And then King David, what does he do? Yeah. He steals somebody else's... He already has a hack, a bunch of wives, but he steals somebody else's wife, and she, in turn, was... Before he, she, David stole her, she was married to a Gentile. So we have... Mentioned in the genealogy of Jesus, we have genealogy of Jesus, we have three Canaanites, I mean, three Gentiles, and a woman who was married to a Gentile. Now, let's think about this for a minute. If you wanted to record your history and you were God, <coughs> wouldn't you like, wouldn't it be better just sort of, there's no reason why he had to mention these women by name, or even mention them at all. Even their story, even hint about them. Well, they're in the line there. Oh, but there's a lot of other women in that line that don't get mentioned. And is it for this reason that the Book of Ruth was even written? Yeah. To record David's history. Yeah. Ancestors. Well, let's be honest. If you knew that these people were in your ancestry, would you go out and announce it to everybody? Well, not much twice. choice. <laughs> if you're going to show the link here, mm -hmm. you have to show the link. And what do we know about Joseph? You remember? Well, but, but even when we're talking Abraham or uh, uh, Rahab and so on and so forth, it's not as if, if um, I mean, they were in the Jewish line. They were they were the descendants or the ancestors of of David. So if you're going to embrace him, yes. you've got to embrace yes. all those others. So but you don't have to mention them. <laughs> Well, you do if you want to make those connections. Brush it under the carpet. Well, what do we know about Joseph? Not much. What kind, what kind of a guy was he? One time when Jesus came back to preach in Nazareth, <clears throat> they listened to him and they were all excited about him. And then they start, he started saying some things they weren't very happy about. And they said, isn't he the carpenter's son? Isn't Mary his mother? Aren't James, Joseph, Simon and Judas, or Judah, his brothers? Aren't all his sisters living here? How many brothers and sisters do we now have? At least six, maybe eight, if the averages hold out. He had four sisters as well as four brothers. And along comes Jesus. Where did those four sisters and four brothers come from? Presumably, well, Joseph's had to be prior wife. Either before, wives. either before Joseph or after Jesus. Well, there's a lot of reasons why they can't be after Jesus. So it has to be before Jesus. Strong so, suggestion that they were older than Jesus when yeah. mm, they came and mm. tried to give him advice. Right, right, yeah. Matthew one twenty five though, Joseph did know, not know Mary until after the birth of Jesus. Mm -hmm. So that doesn't mean, of course, this business of immaculate conception, I mean, she it's all made up. Yeah. Anyway, so. <laughs> so why would God choose the widowed father of several children to be the father of Jesus to whom the inheritance was traced? Today, wouldn't, would Jesus be called a stepson or an adopted son? What would we call him today? he would be called a stepson and a half-brother to mm -hmm. the others. So now a few moments ago... But not really a brother at all, except in the same house. A few moments ago, we were talking about this, is God tinkering around with the fertility here so he can, is God pick Joseph just so he could have this lineage stuff? Or usually we think 
we ascribe the choice of Joseph is because Joseph was, uh, he's the right kind of guy to have for uh, a father figure for, for Mary here. There are other ulterior motives here. Make yeah, this connection back through well, Rahab and... Where did, where did Mary come from? Do we know what tribe she was from? I don't know that I've ever heard that. Well, think about it a little bit. God is smart enough to know. God is smart enough to know that somebody's going to ask a question. And so, this is why we have the genealogy in Luke. This is Mary's genealogy. I'm very convinced because Ellen White tells us, the, you can't really nail this from the Bible, but Ellen White says very clearly that, Jesus, that Mary was also from the tribe of Judah mm. and from the royal line. And that's why, I mean, you know, Luke traces it. So, um, we seem to be told just enough about this story to make it very clear that Jesus was not Joseph's son, but rather a divine Messiah, come from heaven, born to a human mother, and not through immaculate conception either. Since we know this so little about Jesus' childhood, why didn't he just show up what, one day? And you're using this term immaculate conception. What, what is that? Uh, well, I don't know. The, the Roman Catholic Church uh, that venerates Mary comes out of a tradition way, way back, Greek tradition, that says that matter is inherently evil while spirit is inherently good. So they said since Jesus was absolutely perfect. He was God. He couldn't have any kind of contact really with material things. So he, there's no way he could have survived nine months in, in the womb of Mary unless she was also perfect. So uh, the immaculate conception idea is that Mary was somehow miraculously born and therefore she was able to carry Jesus in her womb. Now, there's no proof, there's no evidence for that in Scripture. There's nothing talked about in Scripture at all. That's an idea that came out of Greek philosophy. But it became codified, so to speak, about 150 some years ago. Yeah. It was decided, yeah. It was, it was, Mary was officially declared immaculately conceived about 1850 or somewhere around there by the Catholic Church. So it's a relatively recent new. Well, it's, the idea has been sort of floated around, but it didn't right. become official until about 150 years ago. Mm -hmm. So, considering all of this, why didn't Jesus just sort of show up one day? And, and, and we, How much do we know about his first 30 years? Almost nothing. So why didn't he just sort of show up one day and say, here I am, oh, we have do his thing? Age, age 12, we have that. Well, we have a story of his birth, and we have the age 12, and that's it. Why, why did he need to spend all that time in that wicked city of Nazareth? Is that too complex a question? Well, as preparation for ministry. Well, it wasn't you don't, a seminary. You don't think he could have been prepared <laughs> in heaven? Well, think about this. If Jesus had not been born as a human child, and if he had not struggled through the normal stages of childhood with things like sibling rivalry, which he certainly experienced, it would no doubt be argued that he was never really a human being, but rather just an angel or some sort of supernatural being who could never understand our temptations or our problems. Thus, it was essential for him to go through all these stages, all these struggles, as a human in preparation for his three and one half year of ministry. Similar to what um, Satan accused Job of. Mm -hmm. He said to God, Job is special, he's protected here. Mm -hmm. um, so. so God is removing every possibility of <clears throat> questions about his son's humanity. Okay? But remember, his only humanity he got through whom? Be Mary. Mary. Perhaps the real reasons why Jesus came and lived among us as a child and youth will be hidden until we are able to review the records in heaven. 
we talked last week about the records in heaven. It may be that the onlooking universe learned a great deal about the nature of Satan as he did everything possible to destroy God's mission to planet Earth. I'm sure there's a lot of things. If you read the, those couple of chapters about the childhood of Jesus in Desire of Ages, it just blows you away. I would really recommend If you have a chance to do that, do it before you get a chance to, to talk about this lesson. One thing is very important to understand about the mission of Jesus to this earth. He came to this earth to live among sinners. How many people did Jesus associate that were not sinners? <laughs> Everyone. Only None. his father. Well, his father, yeah, if you want to say that. But on this earth. Even his mother was a sinner. Yes. Even if, so if you go through the Bible, Romans 3, 9 to 10 and 23, 5, 8, John 2, 25, Jeremiah 17, 9, Ecclesiastes 7, 20. I mean, it goes on. I could, could go on and on. Many, many places say that we are all sinful, fallen, broken people. And that certainly included the lineage of Jesus himself. And here's a comment from um, a commentator by the name of Michael Wilkins. He has some very interesting things to say. Listen to this. The genuineness and unlikeliness of this genealogy must have stunned Matthew's readers. Jesus' ancestors were humans with all the foibles yet potentials of everyday people. God worked through them to bring about his salvation. There is no pattern of righteousness in the lineage of Jesus. We find adulterers, harlots, heroes, and Gentiles. Wicked Rehoboam was the father of wicked Abijah, who was the father of good King Asa. Asa was the father of the good King Jehoshaphat, and it goes on. Most of them were wicked after that. Who was the father of wicked King Joram? God was working throughout the generations, both good and evil, to bring about his purposes. Matthew shows that God can use anyone, however marginalized or despised, to bring about his purposes. These are the very types of people Jesus came to save. Isn't that a wonderful thought? I thought the genealogy was just to prove that he, he fulfilled prophecy. Well, so what do you think now? <laughs> well, um, I just wonder what the alternative would be. What kind of geology, ge genealogy would he have that would be different than that? Well... I mean, ideally... I bet you everybody that had ge genealogy had scumbags all the way through. Okay, so what does that tell you about Jesus? He was a real human. Normal. He had the same kind of background as the rest. Does that give you hope? I hope so. It should. He's human? Yes. That, In other words, if... if, if we somehow thought, well, the only reason Jesus was able to do all this stuff is because he was, you know, look at who his father was, you know. He cheated. And another thing that that uh, illustrates is um, when it comes to accountability, <clears throat> we're only accountable for ourselves. Mm -hmm. It doesn't make any difference what our, what our past generations have been or done or even maybe what our present generations are doing. It's a, we, we, we are accountable for ourselves and only ourselves. That's Ezekiel 18 and 33. Yeah, exactly. Very plain, many times, many in various ways it explains. Yeah. No matter how discouraged and how disappointed we might be with our own behavior, we must remember that Jesus came to save sinners just like us. It is great irony that none of the Jewish leaders were among the first people to seek out and worship Jesus as Messiah. Is there any story about the Pharisees coming to worship baby Jesus or the Sadducees coming to worship baby Jesus? Or even being told that he was, had arrived. Well, yeah, they were told. The people who came to worship him were who? Humble shepherds and Gentile magi. Why did God go to such trouble to guide the three magi to see baby Jesus? 
Why did he allow them to approach Herod and inquire of him about the child if he knew that the result would be the death of all those innocent children? I mean, if you're going to bring Gentile magi from a long ways away and go to all the trouble to lead them, I mean, Ellen White says that was a, a group of shining angels that led them. That star was a group of shining angels. How long did it take those angels to, to guide the magi from Iraq to Jerusalem, to Bethlehem? They had to be there long enough to get them motivated to get going in yes. the first place. Well, what? they had to get them there to get, to get the money. Okay. <laughs> why, why, not, why not work with somebody in Jerusalem that's, that's five miles away or something? Because they don't, they don't have the money. <laughs> oh, no, that's not true. There are plenty of people in Jerusalem who had money. Well, is it, there, there is a point to it, though, because they did give gifts, and yeah. the gifts... Came nope. in handy later. Yeah, no, I'm not arguing about that part. Where do the wise men get their information about Jesus? Balaam. <laughs> Balaam? <laughs> <laughs> what Numbers kind of heresy is that, Gordon? Numbers Balaam 24. Was the one that prophesied and yeah, Numbers 24 17. Balaam's prophecy I look into the future and I see the nation of Israel. A king like a bright star will arise in that nation. Like a comet, he will come from Israel. He will strike the leaders of Moab and beat down all the people of Seth, and so forth and so forth. So who's he telling this to? Well, where did he come from? He, he's, this is a part of his prophecy that he gave when he was trying to curse the children of Israel, and he kept blessing them instead of cursing them. Well, that tells me it isn't from Balaam, then. No, it's not from Balaam. Well, well that's what he said. Balaam. Well, it came Balaam through Balaam. Balaam. Well, through, through okay, Balaam. that's different. That, than that, by. That's how the Magi <laughs> learned about it. His if you read Desire yeah. yeah. if you read Desar Bages, page fifty nine, paragraph so, so where was where was Balaam? Who was Balaam talking to? These were uh, these were these, these were, were astronomers were they? or astrologers from the Mesopotamian Mesopotamian Valley that had kept copies of what Balaam wrote. When the Israelites were going through right, the yes. wilderness and... See, Balaam uh, lived four, 1,400 so ba years yeah, earlier. Balaam was trying to create problems. I, now, I may have this confused. I think it was the Moabites, yes. but... Well, yeah. the Moabites and Midianites. Right. So what, what are... What would we... What would we say today? What would we say they were? Were they Arabs? Were they... They were descendants yeah. of yeah. Abraham. They were descendants of sure. Abraham. And, but we don't know where, we don't I'm know what... Not Moab. I'm talking about Keturah and uh, yeah. Midianites. Yeah. But we don't know about Balaam, where he no, came from. No. But he, he was working with these other descendants mm -hmm. of Abraham, who unfortunately at that point in time were enemies of Israel. He was known as a prophet, so... So now how did, um, well, I guess somebody recorded what these prophecies of Balaam that he gave to... How did, how did these prophecies get... Uh, I mean, he gave these to these uh, long ago distant Arabs. How did uh, how did how did how did we get record of it? The, uh, nobody was there to record it. As Balaam recorded. That's a good question. I tried to ask that question before. Moses apparently, remember, Moses spent forty years of his life mm -hmm. herding sheep among the well, it'd be the Midianites. Midianites. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So that must be the way he got somehow. Or other, he got a copy mm -hmm. of this. But well, why did God send those heathen strangers hundreds of miles to see Jesus while he apparently made no effort to guide any of the Jewish religious leaders from Jerusalem just a few miles away? Had he already abandoned his chosen people? Well, I weren't receptive 30 years later when it was pretty obvious he was demonstrating what he was. Ellen White has a very interesting statement. I don't have it here. But she says, the angels came to announce the good news that the Messiah had been born. And they were looking for people on this earth who were excited about that possibility. And they came to Jerusalem and no one was paying any attention. And they were about to leave and go back to heaven when they discovered these shepherds out in the field talking about the possibility that the Messiah was coming. And they said, wow, we can, we can sing to them. Isn't that incredible? And how sad. Mm -hmm. 
Well, it seems apparent that the book of Matthew, while clearly being written primarily for the benefit of the Jewish people, also extended the mission of Christ to include the entire world, and of course, Matthew 28, 19, and 20 say that. From the very beginning, Matthew repeatedly showed how different the responses of the Jews and the Gentiles were to Jesus. Now, of course, she's not talking about all the Gentiles, but they're talking about some Gentiles who had an incredible response to Jesus. Let me, let me ask you this. You've mentioned that Ellen White mentions that the angels came to Jerusalem, didn't find anything, and so forth. And I don't think she's getting that information from Scripture, although it is amazing how she documents with passage after passage after passage after passage many of what she says, but I don't think there's any... So, if I were to recount this information to someone who is is um, is is a is is not a Seventh Day Adventist? Okay. How do I how do I how do I relate this little tidbit of information? Hey, did you know that? And they're going to look at me like. Um, um, well, but I mean, it's clear that the angels did approach the, the the shepherds. It's also clear that they didn't approach anybody in Jerusalem. Well, but but she's saying they came looking. Well, it's it's yeah, the, sure. this information where she says they came to Jerusalem. My, my, and my point is, it's consistent with Scripture. It's not contradicting Scripture, right? Yeah, but my question is, how do I? Yeah. Maybe I just shouldn't tell anybody. Well, where, where does it say that? Because I don't remember that. Well, I I should have. It's in. Um, desire of age, early in Desire. Of no, it's not Desire of Ages. I believe it's in volume. Two or three of. Are you sure she didn't say if she would have, if the angels would have? No, she mm. says it very clearly. If the angels went and looked in Jerusalem, they wouldn't have found anybody to sing to, or something like no, that. No, no, she she says they they went there. They went there. Yeah, they went there, and they, they were about to go back. What she says specifically is, after looking around, they were about to go back to heaven when they discovered these shepherds. Really? Yes. I should have brought that, shouldn't I? Yeah, I've never I've I've never seen, seen that before. We'll we'll we'll, we'll 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 get it in here. Well, I don't know. We can leave a little homework for our viewers. We don't yeah. have to give them everything. Which book well, is that in? I I believe, if I remember correctly, it's in Volume Two of Spirit of Prophecy. It's the the predecessor to Desire of Ages. It's Maybe good. Volume Three. Get your index out and do a little research. I lost my index. <laughs> <laughs> okay, Jesus is portrayed as a king who comes to rescue his people and set up his kingdom. And when he did, his own people rejected his conditions. They did not want the kind of Messiah, the kind of kingdom that he offered. They wanted a Messiah who would help them to conquer the Romans and rule the world. While the Gentiles, who are mentioned, exhibited enormous faith and went to great effort and expense to see Jesus, his own people, even when confronted with wonderful miracles performed by Jesus, accused him of working by the power of the prince of demons. Matthew 2, 1 and 12, 8, 5 to 13, 12, 24, 15, 21 to 28, etc. Why the wise men went to Herod and why God apparently led them there is a mystery. They may have thought that Jesus would naturally be born to the king's family. Or they may have decided to inquire about the baby while in Jerusalem since all the main roads run through Jerusalem. However, their visit to Jerusalem did bring the fact of the Messiah's birth to the attention of all the leaders in Jerusalem. They must have been quite excited when they first learned that someone had received news that the Messiah had been born. But when they realized that the message had come through Gentiles instead of directly to them, no doubt they were offended, and that's Desire of Ages. 61 and 62. How could God give the message of the arrival of the Messiah to a Gentile before he gives it to us? Impossible. Herod probably construed the whole idea to be some sort of treasonous plot to eliminate him and place a real Jew on the throne. Why would Herod be worried about a real Jew? He wasn't a real Jew. He was only half Jew, or maybe even less than that. One wonders how long the people of Jerusalem spent considering the message brought by the wise men. 
Already, the special privileges that the Jews considered theirs exclusively from God were being shared with the Gentiles. The Jews were not ready to accept them. When we trace, when we trace Herod's lineage back, do we find anything that goes back to David? Or? No. Mm -hmm. So he was, in a way, not even supposed to be no. on the throne of any kind. There. It was no. supposed to be... He got there by being a friend of Caesar. Mm. Of course, we do have to remember that, who is it, the grandfather of David was only half Jew? Or? Yeah. Well, I mean, even, even, I mean, look at all these, yeah. <laughs> but presumably a lot more Jewish blood got mixed in over the next 14 <laughs> generations, or however many it was. How sad. The Jews who believed they were the chosen people of God were not even ready to welcome him because they were so spiritually proud. What should our attitude be? It is thus, and again, now I'm, I'm quoting Ellen White. This is Desire of Ages, page 317, paragraph 1. It is thus that every sinner may come to Christ, not by works of righteousness which we have done, but according to his mercy he saved us, Titus 3, 5. When Satan tells you that you are a sinner and cannot hope to receive blessing from God, tell him that Christ came to the world to save sinners. We have nothing to recommend us to God but the plea that we may urge now and ever is our utterly helpless condition that makes his redeeming power a necessity. Desire of Ages 371. Does it give you courage? 317. 317, did I 371? Sorry, 317. Does it give you courage to recognize that it is your utterly helpless condition that might get you to go to Jesus Christ? Well, by the time Jesus was born, there had been 400 years of prophetic silence since the days of Malachi. The idea that the Messiah might be about ready to appear was being rumored among the Jews. Those who studied scriptures carefully believed the prophecy of Daniel 7, I'm, correction, Daniel 9, 24 and 27, and were looking for the Messiah. And how do we know that? When the Magi went to, uh, well, because of uh, the priest that was looking for Jesus at the time of his uh, anointing or baptism, yeah, <coughs> not, not, exactly. or christening, or whatever what's it, it called. Was. Ken, I heard recently uh, from a relatively knowledgeable source, some would say a very knowledgeable source, that in the Old Testament, um, the concept of a Messiah was, um, was not real prominent. The, 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 the information was there, mm -hmm. but they just didn't have that concept. And then that 400 years from the last prophet until the time of Jesus when there was just you know, no information, uh, they began to kind of look and search and and they kind of brought all, developed a concept of the Messiah, um, were able to find these little pieces of the puzzle and put them together. Is, is that, is that, a, is that? Considerably, con to a considerable extent, that's true. Mm. They were, and, and why was that? And uh, we don't have much time left, but in the days of David and Solomon, they thought they were going to rule the world. After the Babylonian captivity, they came back, who are we? Mm -hmm. What reason do we have to exist? Mm -hmm. And they started to develop these ideas as an explanation for their existence as a nation. Well, looking down, there was a famous Jewish male prayer recorded in the days of Jesus, which we, in which they would begin with the words, Lord, I thank thee that I am not a Gentile, a slave, or woman. Paul must have prayed that prayer many times. But he says in Galatians 3, 28 and 29, what? So there is no difference between Jews and Gentiles, between slaves and free people, between men and women. You are all one in union with Christ Jesus. If you belong to Christ, then you are the descendants of Abraham and will receive what God has promised. What does that do with, to your Jewishness? Well, it makes it kind of difficult for you to uh, feel comfortable around Paul if you're Jewish. Well, the Gospel of Matthew can be divided up in several, and we're going to be talking about this through the quarter, divided up into several ways. 
One interesting way is to note the major themes expressed in Matthew. There are at least five major themes. One, the kingship of Jesus. He is clearly described as the son of David, thus being of the royal line, Matthew 1.1. 1, 1. When the wise men found him, they declare, declared him king of the Jews, Matthew 2.2. 2. Later, Jesus entered Jerusalem as a triumphant king, Matthew 21, 1-11. He told his disciples in Matthew 25, 31-46 that one day he would sit as the eschatological king and judge of all men and women. Finally, he acknowledged his royalty before Pilate, Matthew 27, 11, And even his title as king was placed on the cross above his head, head Matthew 27, 37. So, two, Jesus is the fulfillment of much Old Testament, Old Testament prophecy. The four Gospels mention this at least 27 times. Matthew does so the most 14 times. Notice some of the prophecies that Matthew mentions. Christ's birth, Matthew 1, 22, Isaiah 7, 14, Micah 5, 2. His flight to Egypt, Matthew 2, 14 to 15. His home in Nazareth, Matthew 2, 23. His teachings and parables, Matthew 13, 35. His triumphal entry into Jerusalem, Matthew 21, 1 to 5. His arrest, Matthew 26, 54 to 56. His betrayal uh, reprise, Matthew 27, 9. And even the casting of lots for his robes, Matthew 27, 35. Matthew was clearly attempting to prove to his Jewish friends that he's writing to that Jesus was the Messiah prophesied in the Old Testament. At the same time, it's quite clear that a number of the prophecies had an original application in the Old Testament and then only later an application to the birth and life of Jesus. Compare Isaiah 7, 14 and Matthew 1, 21. Compare Jeremiah 31, 15, Matthew 2, 18 and Hosea 11, 1 with Matthew 2, 15. The prophecy about Jesus being a Nazarene as recorded in Matthew 2, 23 is not found in any extant Old Testament apocryphal or pseudepigraphical work to which we have access. We don't know where he got that one. And there's others. I don't have time to go on. But let's just mention the other things. Number three, Matthew is a teaching gospel, systematizing and summarizing the great teachings of Jesus in the kingdom context. Matthew is the, is the writer who talks about the church in the earliest stages. And then Matthew is the one who talks about eschatology in Matthew 24 and 25. So when, we think, when you think about the Gospels, about the story of the Gospels, many of us would turn first of all to the book of Matthew. Is that a fair thing to do? What questions would you like to ask Matthew when you meet him someday in the kingdom? And what is your favorite passage from the book of Matthew? Our kind and wonderful Father, we have just touched something of the book of Matthew. We thank you for giving us this record written by your friend Matthew. Help us to gain from it important truths that help us in our lives is our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen.